So the papers merge two topics. Um, one is sedimentation velocity, analytical ultracentrifugation with um, um, Schlieren optics. And the uh, other is the protein tubulin, which um, is the main component in microtubules, which you all know a little bit about. <clears throat> So this is 1975 for the first two papers. And um, tubulin was sort of discovered in the late 60s, 68 maybe um, is the right place to put it. Um, it was originally called the colchicine binding protein um, because it binds colchicine. And that's how it was sort of initially characterized. It wasn't yet entirely associated with microtubules because you had to make microtubules out of it and visualize them somehow. And that didn't happen until 1972 when a group um, figured out a couple of things. One, um, you needed a nucleotide. So you needed GTP, although some people early on thought it was ATP. Um, uh, and then you also needed some way of controlling the calcium ion concentration because it turns out that calcium is inhibitory. It inhibits microtubule polymerization. Um, and uh, the solution, not entirely understanding what they were doing <clears throat> in, an, in an early science paper, I believe, by a guy by the name of Shalansky, was to add. EGTA. And EGTA sequesters calcium, it chelates the calcium. So any contaminating calcium in the buffers would not inhibit polymerization and they were able to make tubulin polymerize into microtubules. And that sort of changed the whole direction of the research because now people could start studying microtubule polymerization and start asking questions about that. Um, in the 70s, there were, um, I guess, three main groups um, that did a lot of the early work. Um, Timoshev's group was one of them. Uh, Timoshev was at Brandeis, or he spent his, most of his career at Brandeis. Um, and then Gary Borisi uh, was working on this. And Gary um, was in Wisconsin, I'm pretty sure if I remember that right. Um, I think he's actually in Boston now at an institute in Boston. <clears throat> and uh, Mark Kirshner was the other person who was working on it. And Mark Kirshner at the time was at Princeton. He had come out of a um, a centrifuge lab at Berkeley. He had come out of Howard Schachman's lab and his first job was at Princeton. Eventually he went to Berkeley himself and then he left Berkeley and he went to Harvard and he's still at Harvard. Um, Timoshev passed away many, many years ago. I think he retired and moved to Paris and he passed away when he was in Paris. <clears throat> so there were three big groups working on this and um, everybody made important contributions, quote unquote, uh, but everybody took very, very different approaches. Um, and the interesting thing is at the time in the seventies, everybody was using centrifugation. So everybody had centrifuge types of problems um, and projects and uh, the difference primarily was that um, not everybody was as sort of rigorous or compulsive as one another. And the Timoshev lab tended to be more um, rigorous is the way I would like to say it. There, there's a lot of people might disagree with that, but that's my opinion. Um, <clears throat> part of the whole issue <clears throat> 
with studying proteins is the buffer that you choose. We spent a lot of time at the beginning of the class talking about ionic strengths and concentrations and different units. And what separated Timoshev's group from all of the others was that they liked phosphate buffer. We'll see next week uh, an investigation into buffers. And I'm bringing it up for that reason, partially. <clears throat> Do buffers matter? Does the pH matter? Does the ionic environment matter? Do you need magnesium? What kind of nucleotides do you need? Um, but does the buffer itself matter? And so a lot of Timoshev's work was in phosphate for all kinds of reasons. Um, and um, he consequently tended to get different results than other people. <clears throat> Part of the issue is how you isolate the tubulin. We could spend a lot of time talking about tubulin preps. The Timoshev prep, which I think we originally called the Weisenberg prep because um, Dick Weisenberg was in the Timoshev lab and they worked out a different procedure for purifying tubulin than what other people worked out. Uh, some people, my lab, when I was still working on tubulin many years ago, I guess it's many years ago now, um, you would polymerize the tubulin out of a source. The source generally is brain. Uh, the Timoshev lab um, worked on cow brain, calf brain. Uh, most people did work on cow brain if they had access to it. Um, when I first started working on tubulin, when I was a postdoc at Vanderbilt, we used pig brain. Uh, and I take that back. We used cow brain. Um, but even in Vanderbilt, in Nashville, in central Tennessee, they slaughtered 10, time, 10 times more pigs than cows. <clears throat> so it was harder to get the cow brains. Cow, cow heads, you won't know this, you might imagine this, are bigger than pig brains, pig heads, and the brains are bigger. Um, when I moved to Jackson, I could no longer really get cow brains. Nobody kills cows here. We don't, we don't have cows. We have pigs. <clears throat> you don't particularly know that, but if you look around at farms that raise these animals, it's mostly pigs. So in Nashville, I used to use five approximately cow brains, cow heads. Here in um, Jackson, we typically used 15 pig brains. <clears throat> The other main difference historically, um, my lab, I still actually have a piece of wood over in the corner that I would set on a bench and that was where the heads went because they would, they would sell me literally heads um, with the skin still on, bloody heads. It used to be a rite of passage for graduate students to come to my lab and do a prep because you needed a hacksaw and you needed a hammer, usually a rubber mallet, but not always. And you needed crowbars <clears throat> to crack the head open. So you would have to hack the brain and then crack it open so that you take out the brain. Um, and then do whatever you needed to do, which involves removing the outer layer of the brain called the meninges, if you know what that is, <clears throat> get a little, some of the blood and then put it into a wearing blender. I still have multiple wearing blenders in my lab. Grind it up into a soup and then spin out most of the matter and take the soup and then you use the soup in a series of polymerizations, depolymerizations warm polymerization to make microtubules, cold spin to separate the depolymerized tubulin, et cetera. And that's the standard technique that most people in the world use now, used, <clears throat> except for the Timoshev lab. The Timoshev lab basically used precipitation. They basically used techniques that involve precipitating proteins out of solution. This is known in the literature as salting out. And so you would use a series of isolations that are sort of classic 
polymerization methods or isolate protein isolation methods, excuse me, where you never really made microtubules. The advantage of making microtubules is you think you've isolated something that's functional. <clears throat> the Timoshev lab did it differently. And at the last step, there was a magnesium chloride addition that caused the protein to precipitate. And that's what you tended to use. <clears throat> the other important feature is that the Timoshev lab in Brandeis had access to cows, but more importantly, their slaughterhouse was kosher. <clears throat> so they didn't pick up heads. They picked up a, a bag of perfectly clean brains. Somebody at the slaughterhouse would drain the blood out of the animal and then do the extraction of the brain and hand it to the people who were picking it up. Um, I never had that. I actually went to the Timoshev lab once and, and, and watched them do some of this. Um, but it, you, you, it was a major advantage, if you will, because doing preps was sort of a lot of work. <clears throat> Cost a lot of money because of the expense of the buffers and the nucleotides. It took a lot of time. It was basically a three-day prep. And we would do, I don't know what we would do. I don't think we would do 10 preps a year, but we would do uh, quite a few preps a year to keep up with material. And so a lot of what Timoshev published in this block of time uh, from the early 70s through the early mid 80s <clears throat> was with a completely different protein and a completely different kind of prep. And well, so we'll expand on that next week. Um, the other thing that was different was that because of the way that other people isolated the tubulin, um, they often got other things that came along. So other accessory proteins is the way we would have called it in those days. Um, some of these are proteins that you know. So a protein like tau is a microtubule binding protein. It's associated with Alzheimer's. Uh, it's also an intrinsically disordered protein, so it falls in lots of different pigeonholes. Um, but it came along. And then a lot of proteins that we now know as molecular motors, things like MAP2, MAP4. There's now dozens and dozens of molecular motors. Um, those also came along. And so I'll talk about that a little bit more next week, although I don't think we cover the paper that talks about the accessory proteins from the Timoshev lab. Um, the thing was that the accessory proteins also changed the reactions, changed the stoichiometry, changed the nature of the oligomers. And so most of these other labs, the Borisi lab and the Kirshner lab, always worked with the accessory proteins. And those therefore changed what they studied. In fact, the Kirshner lab discovered tau when they were at Princeton. Um, I'm going blank on the graduate student who actually did that work. And it, it became his, a lot of his research when he moved to La Jolla. Forget his name, it'll come back to me eventually. Um, and the Borisi lab did the same thing. They worked on a lot of the accessory proteins, which the Timoshev lab sort of didn't do except in sort of defense. <clears throat> um, and so a lot of different stories evolved in, in the early mid eighties about what was true for tubulin. So the Timoshev approach is therefore a uniquely different story. And a lot of people didn't always believe the Timoshev part of the story. And so there's lots of lore that goes into the field. <clears throat> what has happened today is nobody basically cares about the tubulin. They care about all the accessory proteins and their connection to other things. So the field has changed very, very dramatically uh, in the last 50, 60 years. So let me share my screen. <clears throat> so I think I mentioned to you that um, for me, this was a really big turning point in some ways, because around this time, I knew I wanted to work on something like this. I was in a biophysics lab learning centrifugation, <clears throat> but I was 
thinking about going to work for somebody who was working on Tubulin, and I eventually did do that. Um, and this paper was one of the papers that sort of convinced me uh, that this is what I wanted to do. I almost went to Timoshev's lab, but instead I went to Robley Williams' lab. By that time, he was at Vanderbilt. He had been at Yale, and then he went to Vanderbilt. So this is calf brain tubulin at some pH, neutral pH, which is a little bit higher than what a lot of people worked with. You work with various pHs, but a lot of the field worked at 6.8 or 6.9, different buffers. Um, and the thing about this paper was is that this is sort of the state of the art of the centrifuge field in 1975. Everything and anything you needed to know about centrifugation is in these two papers how you interpret data, how you analyze data, how you think about data is here. <clears throat> and so one of the things that we didn't emphasize, we talked about it in some of the patterns that we talked about when tubulin, when you run a sedimentation experiment and you plot S versus C, the pattern might go down, meaning non-ideality. The, the pattern might be flat, meaning nothing happening, not non-ideal, not associating. Or the pattern might go up. And the up pattern means that there's some kind of a reversible self-association going on. And so the Gilbert and Cox reference here is um, a series of investigators who were modeling data and modeling different kinds of stoichiometries to understand how things migrated in what we refer to as an interacting system. And so this was a fairly complicated interacting system because it made a 26 mer, a ring that sedimented, go, changing from 6s, 5.8s to 42s. So a dramatic big shift in the data. You can see here the references to purification by the Weisenberg approach. And then the fact that there was a 6s tubulin species. The literature said that it was in equilibrium with a 30S species that turned out to be due to these accessory proteins and not just tubulin alone. It also refers to the calcium inhibition that I've already mentioned. Okay, as little as one micromolar calcium was inhibitory. So it sort of gives you a real quick introduction to the things that I just said. It also mentions the use of GTP. Okay, GTP is a required for tubulin assembly in the microtubules. Um, what's interesting in work that I did that we're not gonna have time to talk about uh, in the 90s was that we looked at nucleotide dependence and it turned out that the GTP actually made these rings much more weakly than GDP. And so there's a strong nucleotide dependence and the magnesium dependence changes a little bit because of the nucleotide. But in any event, this is what is going on. So here's a depiction early on of the S value versus concentration. Notice they're collecting data out to as high as 35 mg per mil or 27 mg per mil. The Schlieren optics allowed you to collect data to really high concentrations. This would be hard to do in my instrument with absorbance optics because these samples would absorb to very high amounts. These would have extinction coefficients in excess of 30 or 40. And so it would make it very difficult to work on these solutions. The Schlieren optics allowed you to work on really high concentrations, which made some of the early work in the 50s and 60s sort of interesting because of what they did. So you see this strongly non-ideal and then slightly associating and then turning over, meaning that the non-ideality started to come into effect. And this is the absence or presence of sodium chloride somehow being involved. There's no mention here of magnesium. And so in the absence of magnesium, you get association, but it's really weak. And mostly what you see is non-ideality. If you don't have salt, you don't tend to see association, although this curvature this way suggests something is actually happening down here. Um, but 
the low ionic strength or the low salt concentration, um, there was some kind of a repulsive effect that the protein is highly charged and so it didn't assemble real well. And then this is sort of what the data looked like um, uh, in a Schlieren pattern. And then you started to get unusual bimodality when you started adding magnesium. So the C, A is low magnesium, B is five millimolar, and then C, D, E is higher protein concentrations at 10 millimolar magnesium. And so in a magnesium dependent way and a protein concentration dependent way, <clears throat> you begin to see this bimodality. So that Gilbert theory stuff up above explained this bimodality. And in principle, it was a monomer in equilibrium with a polymer. And as the boundary sedimented, the monomer would fall behind and the polymer would sediment ahead. But in fact, everywhere in the boundary, there was still an equilibrium, but the trailing edge of it tended to have less polymer and more monomer, and the leading edge tended to have more polymer and less monomer. But all the way across the boundary, there was still an equilibrium, and it depended dramatically on the size of the oligomer, the enmer. Okay, and so this is showing a depiction of what the data might look like. This is the gradient, the NDR. So that's basically what this axis is here optically. It, it creates the DNDR or the gradient directly. And then it's showing you an increase in protein concentration at eight millimolar magnesium. And notice this is magnesium chloride. My lab tended to work in a lot of the field tended to work on magnesium sulfate which mattered only in the sense that the sulfate had a higher charge. And so it changed the ionic strength, which turned out to be a big factor along with other things. <clears throat> and so you can see there's a monomer that eventually evolves into a shoulder that eventually involves into a peak. And then what happens for six, seven, eight, and nine, this peak doesn't grow anymore. It sort of stays constant. And then it's the faster peak the oligomer peak that tends to grow. And you can see this sort of back falling eight goes to nine. It looks like it slows down. That slowing down is actually the non-ideality. It's non-ideality that makes this concentration dependent. It's making more polymer, but it's running slower because at the higher concentration, the non-ideality creates a backflow creates a backflow, people are walking into my lab, Make, uh, that slows this down. This is essentially equivalent to the, um, the frictional coefficient in the derivation, although we expressed it in terms of uh, S over one plus KSC. So there was a concentration dependence that causes this. We'll come back to that in a moment. Okay, and so this is sort of what the raw data looks like. <clears throat> and then we plot what is known as the second moment. And so what we're plotting is not um, all of the data, we're plotting an average over the boundary. Okay, and so that's what the second moment means. What's the kind of the average S value, even though it's bimodal. When we get to the third paper, which is my paper, the difference in what we do today what we have done since, um, it was around this time that we figured some stuff out in terms of solving the LAM equation for systems like this uh, computationally, but it really wasn't until we reprogrammed the whole thing sort of in the 90s where we could actually fit for the shape of the boundary. And then we no longer plotted the weight average per se, we just fit the entire shape and you'll see that when we get to it. Okay, and then here's the concentration dependence um, that, that they introduce. And this doesn't look entirely like what I had showed you before, what we talked about before. 
was, and we use the term KSC, Timoshev always is used as G because this can be written as a, what's called a Taylor expansion that approximately looks like this. And so if you expand this out to higher order terms, you don't usually need the higher order terms past C. Um, you could express it this way or you could express it this way. Okay, and so this is the way that Timoshev expresses it. Uh, this is the way that I express it and a lot of us express in sort of the current way that we think about it. Um, either one of them, quote unquote, work. They're what we refer to as phenomenological. What that means is um, it fits the data and you don't worry too much about the difference between these. So those, there's a small difference between them. And then, then they plot these weight average values versus concentration. And notice we're still going out to about 20, 25 mg per mil. Uh, and you can see that at, these are at magnesium concentrations of 5, 8, 10, 16. Uh, migs per mil. What's the difference here? Oh, I'm sorry. Right. So this is the full data sets plotted. And then this down here is just for the slow peak, just showing that the slow peak grows moves faster and then plateaus and stops growing, okay? But the full boundary actually has boundaries that sediment much, much faster and then turn over. So again, I think this is 16, 10, eight, and then a combination of what the slow boundary looks like, okay? Um, Strictly speaking, it's the whole thing that you want to study, although you learn something about plotting just the slow boundary. Okay. If this were just a monomer polymer, if this were just this, this change here would not happen. There would be a monomer peak and a polymer peak, and the monomer peak would not move. It would just stay, it would remain at that one point. The fact that it moves, the fact that it accelerates, means that all of these intermediates must exist, and they're also contributing. Okay, and so that's the information that comes out of this boundary moving, continuing to move. Okay, and so one of the things that um, the centrifuge is great for is dissecting out assembly mechanisms. So we say that the centrifuge is great for looking at purity. Do you see a single boundary? It's great for getting size, molecular weights, and shape, frictional coefficients. But if you have reversible association, it also gives you a window into what the oligomers are, what the association constants are, and what the presence of intermediate reactions. And so this right here depicts that full gamut of things. The non-ideality will teach us something else. It gives us some information about the backflow um, and essentially the excluded volume of the polymers. Um, but where the S values sort of stop also gives you information about the oligomer sizes. Okay, And so that's what this, as raw data, so you can think about this again as here's a whole series of data points um, and the information that you get out of it. I will say that there's a lot of data in this part of the curve. Uh, there's not a lot of data up here. I appreciate the amount of concentration that this is requiring. 
A lot of this would have been impossible to do by the methods that the other labs were using because they didn't get concentrations that were 20 and 30 mg per mil. So they couldn't even have done these experiments. That's one of the differences that that precipitation Weisenberg method was between that and the polymerization method. Um, generally speaking, when we isolated tubulin, we got something in the range of 10 to 15 mg per mil, but almost never 25, 30 mg per mil. There was sort of a limit because of the ways that it worked. Okay. So here's the scheme that therefore comes out of it. And I explain to you now just why that is. The paper is sort of explaining that, okay? That you need all of these intermediates. And remember, if you go all the way back to when we first derived some equations for self-associating systems, and there were two ways of doing it. One of the ways was stepwise and one of the ways was overall. And you can see that this technique is essentially using overall, but it will combine excuse me, it's using stepwise, one monomer adding at a time, so that each step has some kind of an association constant, okay, expressed in some kind of uh, molar units, although they might be using molality here, and they're using molality, which has to do with moles per kilogram, but nonetheless, it, it, it's essentially the same sort of stepwise approach, okay, and so they're referring to this technique known as, or this model known as isodesmic, okay? And so what did you glean from a linear indefinite, sometimes referred to as isodesmic? What can you tell me from your looking at this right now about um, what this means? Anybody? Um, does that mean the K2 is equal to K3, K4, the... Um... All of the equilibrium constants for each step are right. equal. They're the same. That's exactly right. Okay, all of them are the same. So what that means is all the Ks are the same. And when we get to delta Gs, that means the delta G for each step is the same, okay? They all equal um, the same value, okay? And they're all equal to one another, okay? Whatever it is, et cetera. All of them are the same, all right? So they have equal free energies. It doesn't say it here. <clears throat> Um, there's a competing idea known as isoenthalpic, where all of the delta H's are the same, not the delta G's. And the reason for that has something to do with the entropy being different when you add a monomer to a monomer as opposed to when you add a monomer to an oligomer. It has something to do with the change in the entropy, the change in the the configuration um, going from a monomer dimer to a monomer enmer. And so strictly speaking, we should be talking about isoenthalpic. But historically, we have always used this term isodesmic, which incidentally was originally described experimentally by Van Holt in a paper in the early 60s. Okay, so this is sort of now the model. There's an isodesmic polymerization justified by this, but it then grows into some kind of an endpoint indicated by these peaks that you see. Okay, and so why does it stop? Why does it not keep going? And the answer appears to be that it makes some kind of an endpoint. All right, and so the analysis of these data requires us to convert S values to oligomers, okay? And so the various data sets, let's see what we have here. The various data sets were then fit to some kind of a model, 
that required that we have some assumption. Let's go back up here. Some assumption about what, here we go, what S2 is, S3 is, S4 is, S5 is, et cetera, SI is. So you have to have some way of knowing what the S value was in terms of stoichiometry, and you have to have some way of relating them to one another. Okay, and so you had to make some kind of an assumption because you don't see the dimers, <coughs> the trimers, the tetramers, the pentamers. You see a starting boundary that moves. You can see this shifting and you see an oligomer. Okay, and so you can sort of glean that there's a monomer plus something and there's an oligomer but all of the other intermediates become sort of difficult. And remember, S gives you the ratio of M over F, which is essentially size over shape. And so you had to have some understanding. If you're assuming they're all monomers that are, are all um, of spheres, excuse me, then you could make some assumptions, okay? And so that was part of the challenge for doing this. You had to have some way of knowing how to relate all of these equilibrium constants to their concentration dependence, whether it be on mix per mil or molar. And so that's what's going on here. We're changing the units from molar to mix per mil, and we're trying to sort out what all these equilibrium constants are. But then we have to know something about the average molecular weight. So this is that weight average molecular weight sum of S sub i times C sub i, okay? Where the S values now are assigned in some way. And then the concentrations can be reflected by some kind of overall equilibrium constant or some stepwise equilibrium constant. And then to all of this, you can add the non-ideality term. So notice what's happening here. We have a C sub i, but now it ends up involving some kind of a reversible equilibrium expression that is equivalent to the C sub i's, okay? And so that's what the math is telling you. And so you're gonna have to fit this data to this type of association. Now, it's not explicitly saying it here. I'm pausing here to look around to make sure I'm, I'm right about this. Ah, uh, here it is. This is what this is what I'm looking for. Here is the approximation that they make. That the S value of the oligomers goes as I to the two thirds. So think back to what we were talking about when we did this last week. I to the two thirds came out of the spherical approximation. So we're now going to assume that a dimer. has an S value equal to two to the two thirds times S1. And an Imer has an S value of I to the two thirds times S1. That's what this is saying, okay? And it therefore is a spherical approximation, okay? So tubulin is a dimer, it's an alpha beta dimer. And these oligomers could potentially do this, or they could do this. This is what they do. And clearly this is more or less a sphere. It's, a, it's actually uh, 80 angstroms by 40 angstroms. So it's already not a sphere. But this is definitely not a sphere. And so we're already making a mistake by using n to the two thirds. <clears throat> the problem is you need to know for every single one of these oligomers what the proper connection is or the correction is. And so the easiest thing to assume is n to the two thirds, okay? It's already a complicated problem. Let's not worry about shape, okay? Let's not worry about shape. <clears throat>
But remember from the plot that we had where we plotted globular proteins on an axis where they all sort of fell off the line by about a factor of 1.2, which was hydration. And then there were examples that were off the line by a lot. Myosin was the, one of the examples. So this is going to introduce some kind of uncertainty into the value. And the oligomers are going to sediment faster quantitatively, conceptually, than they really do sediment. Long extended molecules like this have far more drag, bigger shapes, and will sediment slower relative to their mass. Remember, this goes as F over mass over frictional coefficient. And so there'll be an intrinsic bias, if you will. Okay. But because the problem's already complicated, it's 1975 and we have no way of knowing what all these oligomers look like. There's no way of isolating them. They're all in equilibrium with one another. There you go. Okay. And so then when you fit the data, and so that's what's gonna happen in the analysis. When we fit the data to various models, what the S value of the oligomers are, what the biggest oligomer is, what the concentration dependence is. This came out of that early figure up here, uh, right here. The G of 0.019 comes out of the data right here. So it's the concentration dependence. And then we come up with some kind of a K uh, and we try to fit these weight average curves by some kind of theoretical curve fitting, all right? So this is 1975, we don't have laptops. Okay? We have mainframe computers you don't know anything about. Um, you had to write the code in a way, mostly the code in those days was written in Fortran. And you had to basically come up with some kind of a model that involved some connection to equilibrium constants on a mass or a molar basis. Um, and so this was all reflected on a, mig per mil basis, um, but eventually uh, you had to convert that to molar to make some kind of a free energy connection. Uh, and so this is the kind of analysis that you would do. And then you would sort of look for the best fit and you would come up with some kind of a model involving 26 mers with an S value of 42 S as, as we'll see in a second. Okay, the 42 S seems big if you look here, but what I want you to appreciate is this fall off creates sort of a, a suggestion. And the suggestion is, is that these data actually extrapolate back to zero protein concentration this way. And so this is where the 42S comes from. It's extrapolating these data back because it becomes non-ideal and it starts to slow down. But if you extrapolate these data back, you could get something that seems consistent. And, and the shape of this is defined basically by that G value and the concentration dependence here. Okay, so what gives you the best fit um, and what the K values are that, that give you the best fit. And that's what this all comes out to be. And there's some criteria here involving the difference between the weight average fitted and the weight average observed squared. So this is what's called the RMS uh, for the fits averaged over all the data points. Okay, and so you do that for every single one and then you take those values and then you start plugging it back into the equation. <clears throat> okay, so the way you do this is you plug it back into the equation and you say, okay, here's a K, how much dimer is there? How much trimer is there? How much, et cetera, et cetera, is there? And then above about 10 mg per mil, suddenly there's this oligomer that shows up. And so how much oligomer is there and why does it stop? And it ends up stopping because there's this additional step. And the additional step has to do with the fact that there's a ring closure that defines an endpoint. And the ring closure adds a certain amount of energy. Uh, and I'll try to depict this in a small version. It's growing, it's growing, it's growing. And then the final step is not a bimolecular reaction. 
it's a unimolecular reaction where this end and this end join, and that causes this much gain in um, free energy, but it also defines the end point, the enmer where it stops growing. Okay, so this is why the final step and the final oligomer is stable, because this end point is here. If this endpoint were more stable, then all the intermediates might not be highly populated, but it depends on how much energy you gain from the endpoint. So that's a defining feature of this. Okay, and so this is simply showing you what it looks like. And you never really make much of the intermediates. They sort of dwindle away until you mostly make polymers. Although you always have some intermediates because the monomer boundary is always there okay and they did some attempts at simulating i won't get into all of the details of how they try to simulate the shapes of the boundary this was being done in those days with some software being developed by david cox who was mentioned up above and then the real big breakthrough if you will was managing to see images of these rings uh, and so it ends up that their model is that there's an inner ring and there's an outer ring and that alpha, beta, alpha, beta on the inside and alpha, beta, alpha, beta on the outside is what sort of brings, gives rise to ring closure. And they play this sort of rotation game that they describe here where they try to enhance the image of this. 25 years later, 25, 75, maybe 25 or 30 years later, um, there are people who think that this double ring doesn't actually exist, that this is actually a helix that looks like a double ring. It could be a buffer issue. It could be other kinds of issues, but other people think that this is helical, not ring-like. Um, I, I don't take sides in this. I think it's possible that the double ring is stable and the helix is also stable. The helix would imply that it could grow bigger. The other thing that's worth talking about is that tubulin has tails. And the tails are highly acidic. They have lots of glutamic acid, a little bit of aspartic acid. And worse than that, they have side chains that branch off of polyglutamate, okay? So they actually have a lot of charge. Brain tubulin in particular has a lot of this glutamylation going on. It's literally off the side chain of one glutamate and then it grows like a normal peptide bond. So there's a lot of charge here. And one of the reasons you need the magnesium is to neutralize this charge. Okay. So even in a microtubule, these charges are all on the surface. Somebody describes this as sort of a charged brush, like a brush you use to clean a bottle. This structure, all of the charged side chains are in the interior. And in this structure, they're in the interior. So you're bringing all of the charge together. This was always thought of as an intermediate to a microtubule. We now know that that's not true. We knew a long time ago that this is not true. This is just a different oligomeric form that is in competition with microtubules. But the charges are all on the inside. And so the magnesium ends up being on the inside. Otherwise, you get charge charge repulsion and it isn't stable. Okay, so that's the requirement for ionic strength, but also for divalent cations to neutralize all of this charge in tubulin. This is all sort of background. It's discussed in uh, some other papers. And then they do some hydrodynamic analysis. This should look familiar to you because we actually derived this equation in, in a different form, slightly different form. Uh, we talked about the hydration term. So there's the hydration, the amount of water that was involved. And then they're using this to come up with some kind of F over F naught 
And they're actually using what at the time we called Kirkwood theory. I discussed Kirkwood theory briefly with you. Um, at the time people used Kirkwood theory as it was developed, um, there were some other publications that had come out by this time. Um, there's some stuff uh, that had been published by uh, Victor Bloomfield and Van Hold and Garcia. Um, hmm, am I really going to go blank on that? I'm going to go blank on a name. Sorry, let me go down to the bottom here. It may be here, and I'm just forgetting. Yeah, it's not even here, which is sort of interesting. He, so they just used Kirkwood. Huh. Before we're done, I'll try to remember. the. This was sort of the original application of Kirkwood theory as an intermediate development. I think this happened around 1968. And the guy who whose name I'm forgetting developed the modern version of this. And I mentioned hydro for doing these calculations. Um, and then we've had further development, primarily the software package called SOMO. Uh, and there's a, other packages out there now. But it's basically a way of predicting, uh, if you come up with some model for what the polymer looks like, what the S value would look like, and get it coming up with a value that is consistent with 42S. And so here is the equation. This, you should again recognize this a little bit from what was in Van Hold. And then here are various sorts of models predicting what the S value might look like, the numbers of subunits, the frictional coefficients, the radius of the particle, and what model might give us a 42S model. Okay. And so that's basically what they had to come up with. And that's how they came up with it. Okay. Now they mention here these other estimates, the 36S. It turns out that the 36S is an oligomer that is formed with MAP2. So MAP2 induces um, a 36S ring where the MAP2s are on the surface and they literally stick out, okay? This is stuff that was done primarily by the Borisi lab, although the Kirshner lab was first involved in discovering this. The Borisi lab then went in and cut off the tails here and it became 42S. So you can see sort of the connection, the map stabilized the ring. Tau with tubulin, so there's tubulin in here, made a 20S ring. So it made a single walled ring, not a double walled ring, seems to be the best way to interpret the data. Okay, and so you see why there was a big difference <clears throat> These didn't necessarily require magnesium or high concentrations of magnesium. And so the accessory proteins were stabilizing these oligomers as opposed to the magnesium stabilizing these oligomers. Okay. So what questions do you have about this paper before we move on? Uh, Dr. Correa, they didn't mention why they chose cow um, brain. Is it is it why didn't they didn't they kill go, pigs in a kosher pig house? Jews only, don't Jews Jews don't eat pig. So a kosher slaughterhouse would not have slaughtered pigs. They only slaughtered cows. And there are not that many pigs uh, raised in the Northeast. You find pigs in this country. I mean, everything has changed. The economics have changed as various models have come up. There are huge slaughterhouses now that grow pigs that raise pigs, um, but barbecue, <clears throat> do you eat barbecue? Do you eat pig? 
poor sign. Yeah. Not, okay. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. But those are all Southern barbecue is with pig. Mm. Sometimes you will find cow, but most of the time, the slabs that you get in Mississippi, Alabama, Tennessee, over into North Carolina, South Carolina, that's mostly pig, not entirely. Uh, and, but in New England, you tend not to find pigs, you tend to find cows. And out west, you tend to find cows, not pigs. So you will not find pigs in Colorado or Montana. You'll find cows. Cows. Okay. okay. And so part of it is that, plus the fact that it was a kosher slaughterhouse. They would not slaughter pigs. Okay. It would contaminate all the material. So uh, do that? Did, did they have to pay money to get the brain or it was just? It depended on your arrangement with the company. Uh, the slaughterhouse I used here, I would buy the heads from. I think the slaughterhouse at Brandeis, it was for free. Okay. That would be a lot of money. Uh, no, you, we used to pay, um, uh, what was I paying? Was I paying $15 a head, something like oh, that? Okay. Uh, because people buy head in Nepal, uh, not, not cow. We don't eat cow in Nepal, we eat buffalo. And mm -hmm. the people, or goat, people eat head. Right. And, <laughs> so they pay a lot of money for. Right, but that's because you're, you're preparing them in some exotic way to be sort of <laughs> some kind of a special yeah dish um there are people uh in the south primarily uh who eat every part of the animal mm. um uh and brain is certainly something that many people eat okay yeah, i agree uh but it's if you buy them in this way from a slaughterhouse uh they're not that it's not that expensive it the the, the expense is the time and the effort yeah preparation yeah right it's all means... of the preparation it's yeah. getting the animals freshly killed you would have to go to the slaughterhouse first thing in the morning when they kill because the brain the tubulin goes bad very quickly in a warm dead animal and how do you preserve the tubulin like do you put it in something before you you because you can't keep it dry i guess when you bring the head from the slaughterhouse no you this... just try to you just try to work quickly Okay. It works better in the in the in the winter when it's cooler. Um, you yeah. you lose the so the slaughterhouse. I used two slaughterhouses back in the day, and each of them is um, a twenty minute drive. Okay. And so that so I would often try to bring ice, but it's really hard to cover um, plastic bags of heads with ice. And then yeah. in the summertime, the ice melts within minutes. So you, you, you're, you're, it, it's entirely time. If you yeah. could do the preparation on site. So when you handed me a bag of heads at Brandeis in Boston, you would just drop the bag into a bucket of ice. <clears throat> mm -hmm. So that's part of why you would get better yields out of that prep. So it's entirely time and effort. The secret of isolating active material is often fresh. An awful lot of biochemistry uh, back in the day uh, involved slaughterhouses. When I first moved to Jackson, there was a big slaughterhouse um, down uh, near uh, I-20, um, where the I-20 and I-55 meet. And mm -hmm. in that neighborhood down there where sort of uh, State Street sort of goes, goes into the highway, there was a big slaughterhouse up on the hill there. And that was a great place to get material because they killed a lot of animals and you could you could get what you needed fairly quickly. Uh, we spent some time uh, isolating uh, tubulin out of blood, and you could get a lot of blood because it was part of the process of killing. Yeah. Um, these other slaughterhouses I went to were very small, and they didn't kill a lot of animals. Okay, and and do you do you homogenize the brain to to isolate the tubulin? Yes, you cut open the brain, you pull out the brains, you take off the blood meninges on the outside. Then you cut it up into small sections, yeah. you weigh it out and mix it with a certain amount of buffer and throw it into a homogenizer. And okay. then we had protocols for what speeds and how long. And then you basically create a milkshake. That's mm -hmm. basically what it looks like, <laughs> a slightly red milkshake. Uh, and that then had to be spun to get rid of all of the mostly fat. Uh, 
and then there would be a supernatant that you would then have to suck off and it would be a clear reddish solution <clears throat> that we you, would then you, begin to polymerize and cycle uh so you'd call it the supernatant and get in started. that case it's a supernatant that's right okay. when you pull it when you polymerized it then the microtubules would pellet and you would throw away the soup and then you would put it on ice and resuspend the, the pellet using okay. what's called a dounce and then you would throw away the pellet and keep the soup and then you would do that multiple times okay that's interesting yeah okay any more so doctor yeah dr Correa. so the use of brain is tubulin and like more enriched in brain or was that basically just more wasted tissue that you had better access so, to so brain is rich in axons and axons okay, are okay, so yes. full of of microtubules understood okay thanks typical tissue every cell has microtubules but it's not predominantly microtubules axons are predominantly microtubules and so right they're like super highways of microtubules <laughs> right and so so gram per gram there's way more tubulin in brain than anywhere else and then it turns out that those modifications that i mentioned somewhere up here um uh don't occur in cells as regularly as they do in brain okay and so brain became the preferred method uh, and to this day, if you still wanted to do a tubulin prep, your choice would be brain. We, you can isolate tubulin out of cells. There's not a lot of material there. Uh, you cannot easily express tubulin. There's a lab at the NIH that has sort of worked out some protocols for expressing tubulin um, in uh, various media, uh, but it's a real hard thing to do in quantity. It's hard to get a lot of material. Okay. That makes sense. Thanks. So this is the second paper and it discusses it in terms of thermodynamics. And so it summarizes what was discovered and then it represents the isodesmic character uh, and then we begin to have a discussion of how you interpret the data with magnesium. Um, and so we're going to get into enthalpies, entropies, et cetera. So let's take a short break. Okay, uh, five minutes. 
Okay, are we coming back? Okay, <clears throat> so this second paper <clears throat> they describe is thermodynamics. And so in the first paper, it was sort of hydrodynamics and working out the stoichiometry. Uh, in the second paper, they get into talking about the magnesium dependence, but the thermodynamics of the association. And so that means that they have to look at <clears throat> the concentrations of ligands, but also temperature and actually pressure. Okay, so they describe what the overall reaction is, um, and they write down the relationship between the mig per mil weight concentration versus molar or molal concentration, and then the way that they define ring closure. And so there's a what's called a propagation constant or bond formation constant for each successive step, and then ring closure. And the association, the additional free energy associated with ring closure. And that association has multiple components. Uh, it has something to do with the fact that the stoichiometry is different. So that you gain something because you don't change the number of particles in solution. And then it also has an opportunity for the oligomer to grow in multiple ways. When I'm making an oligomer, I can add a subunit here, but I could also add a subunit here. And so it's always true that there are two sites for addition. In principle, the beta alpha can also add. So there are two ways to add. That's where the four sort of comes from. Uh, this doesn't happen. It's only alpha, beta, alpha, beta. You never get beta, beta, or alpha, alpha, okay? And so those also in principle contribute to what we're getting. And so they wanna put some kind of a number on how much energy you gain from different types of reactions. <clears throat> and the fitting kind of gives you estimates of what these might be. And that ends up being how they go about this, okay? And so that's sort of the theory behind how they're gonna do the analysis. And then uh, they do some magnesium binding uh, up to fairly high concentrations of magnesium. And they come up with some best fit. You'll notice that um, they claim that they get as many as 48 binding sites. In a scattered plot, the, the fit is linear and they all has the same equilibrium constant of 100. So that's pretty weak binding, <clears throat> 100, okay? But there are 48 of them and there's this charge neutralization. It's probably not the best way to think about this because it, the, the magnesium is sort of everywhere around the protein and it may be localized around the tails more than the whole protein, <clears throat> but it's a general way of thinking about how you might interpret the data. And then they show uh, best fits. They worry about the non-ideality of the magnesium concentration. So they introduce the term of activity and they worry about how you gain or use the activity of the magnesium. <clears throat> and then they come up with apparent equilibrium constants in a weight scale or in a inverse molar scale. And what, the, what this corresponds to in terms of free energy. All right, and so now you have some connection to free energy and the, the um, magnesium dependence of that free energy. And then they start getting a little uh, more complete and write down essentially a total derivative. And we talked about this much earlier. How does the equilibrium constant depend upon pH? Does it depend upon the water concentration because that's a variable? And then it does it depend upon the concentration of some other ligand like magnesium. And so magnesium is what we're gonna be interested in. And so you could write down a total derivative. If you hold the pH constant, if you hold the water activity constant, then you're just primarily going to look at 
whatever this ligand is, magnesium in this case, all right? But if you go through the math of this, what you realize is, is that when magnesium binds, and what we're doing basically is saying that two tubulin dimers plus magnesium make some kind of a polymer, and the amount of magnesium bound might be N, okay? There's some kind of a magnesium dependent polymer. And so we're looking at the magnesium dependence of the equilibrium constant. What we end up with is basically magnesium bound in the dimer minus the magnesium bound in the oligomer. And so you end up with this magnesium binding in the evaluation, but you have to take into account the fact that there might be also a change in hydration. There may not be a change in water activity in the buffer, but maybe the magnesium displaces water. And so you sort of have to take into account the water. And it becomes part of the total derivative that you have to include it. And so you get this total difference, initial minus, final minus initial for the overall system, but it's composed of magnesium and water and changes in magnesium and water. And they spend some time discussing this here, how many water molecules might be involved in the reaction uh, or how many magnesiums might be involved in the reaction. And so you end up with this delta value that predicts a certain amount of release. And the answer you come up with in their data set is 1.15. Another way of thinking about this is if you plotted the natural logarithm of the equilibrium constant versus uh, the natural logarithm of the magnesium concentration or the activity of the magnesium concentration, you would get some kind of a line and the slope of that line would give you this delta nu value. It would tell you how many magnesium ions are involved in the reaction, okay? And this type of a plot, LNK versus concentration of something, is known as a Wyman plot. And it has a universal sort of appeal. You can do anything that might be a variable here to get what the slope of that line might be. And that's where they get it from the data up above, a straight line with a slope of, okay? And so as you increase the magnesium concentration, I've drawn this incorrectly. The LNK goes up, you could lose magnesium or you could lose water or you could gain magnesium binding and drive the reaction. And so the slope that gives us a one is actually this one. So it says that there's an excess magnesium bound to the oligomer for every subunit added. So the slight complication in this is that GTP binds to tubulin as a magnesium complex. And that's what actually gets hydrolyzed when tubulin makes a microtubule. When it makes a ring, it doesn't hydrolyze the GTP, but the magnesium comes along for free, okay? And so early on, is this the magnesium we're talking about? Is it a different magnesium? Is it somewhere else in the reaction? This is probably not the magnesium, but certainly it was an issue sort of early on in the discussion. The interesting thing is that GDP doesn't actually need a magnesium. It binds to the GDP in tubulin very weakly. So there's a magnesium dependence to GTP binding. There isn't a magnesium dependence to GDP binding. Okay, that, that's sort of uh, extra. Um, that was sort of worked out in the late 80s, primarily by me, actually, when I was in Robley Williams' lab. Okay, <clears throat> and so you can do this for all the different ligands. It's a Wyman plot because Wyman was the first one to introduce this idea. 
looking at oxygen binding to hemoglobin, but they also then looked at pH dependence of oxygen binding to hemoglobin. And they looked at other cofactors that might be involved in affecting oxygen binding. Okay. Uh, and if you can study oxygen binding to hemoglobin, you can study proton binding to hemoglobin, and you can learn something from both of them about the other. And that was sort of the universality of, of the Wyman analysis. But it, it applies to all of these systems, and this is the connection. Write out a total derivative and ask how does the equilibrium constant change with the ligand? They then looked at temperature. <clears throat> and so this is a plot of temperature data. I think the uh, one is five degrees, two is 10 degrees, three is 20, is 30 degrees, and four is 37 degrees. And so I think what you can see is as you raise the temperature, the oligomer goes away. Okay, so there's a temperature dependence to the oligomer formation. All right, and this allowed them to do a Van Hoff analysis. And in doing the Van Hoff analysis, they were able to come up with thermodynamic parameters. And so oligomer formation, K2 in, in particular, has a positive enthalpy, although you can see the enthalpy is going down is going up with temperature. As the temperature goes up, the positive character of the enthalpy goes up. Okay, the delta G gets, <clears throat> and the delta, but this delta G seems to actually get bigger here, but it's because of the entropy. The entropy is what's driving this reaction. So this counteracts the change in the enthalpy. Okay, and so this implies that this is a hydrophobic effect. <clears throat> Remember, Ross and Subramanian, the table that I've mentioned to you before, <clears throat> that hydrophobic effect is a positive enthalpy and a positive entropy. <clears throat> okay, so that's what this is coming from. Oh. Okay. And so this gives you the character. <clears throat> and then the heat capacity is small. That's a relatively small number and positive. Okay, so that means that there's curvature to the data. It's not a straight line that the enthalpy changes with temperature as the data suggests. And you have to interpret the data and fit the data to some kind of a polynomial, not just one over T, but something that has a other structural form that allows you to get curvature. And this is one of the ways of doing that. Uh, Timoshev used an old sort of approach that's described in some of this old literature here, primarily this reference by Glassstone. Um, this is the way that I fit most of my data uh, that was temperature dependent. And in addition to getting enthalpy from the parameters in the fit, you also can get a heat capacity out of this C term that essentially accounts for the curvature, okay? And then they did pressure. And the pressure was done in an interesting way. And this is the way that almost all people do pressure at the time. Um, you put a little mineral oil on top of the solution. And when you do that, you lose a little sample uh, so the sedimentation pattern moves in the cell because the top now has mineral oil on it, but that creates, it floats and it creates pressure on the top. So it gives you a pressure dependence. And the result, if you read the text and sort of look at the figure, the bimodal pattern doesn't really go away when you add this mineral oil. And so it suggests that there's very little pressure dependence. Okay, very little pressure dependence. Um, and this is the method that Timoshev uses, and this is the method that Borisi also used in the, the rings that they studied with the map, with the map two. The original work on pressure um, came out of Bill Harrington's lab at Johns Hopkins in collaboration with a guy by the name of Gerson Kegelis. Um, 
keg at the time was um i think he was still at a small university in massachusetts called clarkson but soon after this or maybe before this he had moved to the university of connecticut where i got my degree and so keg was actually on my committee and they studied pressure dependence uh, and so the original papers on pressure dependence come out of Kegless's and Harrington, Bill Harrington's lab. They studied a protein called myosin, which makes myosin filaments. So you can think of thick filaments and muscle. And so it makes a really big oligomer. Okay. These are huge oligomers. N is very big, um, hundreds. And there's a really big oligomer that has a really big change in volume upon assembly. And so if you did the same kind of experiment with myosin, what would happen is, is that higher positions in the cell, as it's sedimented to the bottom of the cell, the pressure would be enough to depolymerize the myosin and suddenly the oligomer would fall apart and you would actually get convection. All right. They didn't use, um, they didn't use uh, mineral oil. They actually constructed a cell. It was basically a bomb where you put the cell into a chamber and then you pressurize the chamber and you had a screwdriver into the cell through a gasket with a cloak with it was on a, a screw that you would actually be able to close the the port where you fill the cells and they would pressurize the sample side of the cell and then turn this screw close the chamber and pressurize the interior of the cell and so they could actually get to much higher pressures by this method uh, the chamber, the cell that they used, they described it buckling under pressure. So they were literally working with a bomb. If they weren't careful, it was going to explode and kill somebody. Later on, Keg made a different pressure cell that had really thick walls. And you would put the cell in the middle of it. But these walls were so thick that there was no reason to expect the bomb to explode. And the screw came in through the top and did the same sort of procedure. This was one of the best examples you could have chosen, and they did some really nice work on this. OK. Um, and so this paper kind of quickly gets to a discussion of, once it gets to the sort of the, the small nature of the pressure dependence, there really wasn't much. And then they get into sort of a discussion of how to interpret the data, how to interpret the heat capacity. They get a little bit into thinking about the enthalpic components of the reaction, and they sort of um, terminate the discussion fairly quickly. This is as much as we can say. We know that it's sort of a hydrophobic effect, release of water, binding of magnesium, sort of a sort of result. Okay. It discussed anything and everything that you needed to know to study centrifugation in the mid 70s. Okay, how you sort of simulate data, how you fit data, how you interpret the thermodynamics, how you look at temperature dependence, pressure dependence, ligand dependence, everything is sort of here. And if you read this paper and every other paper that was in the reference list, you were quote unquote an expert in sedimentation in 1975. Okay, so one way of thinking about this is you read a paper like this and then for a month, you're an expert and then people publish other stuff and suddenly you're behind again okay uh yeah there's the wyman reference that i mentioned okay so when we came oh it's over here when we came back to this uh in the 90 in the 2000s so this is um 30 years later my student Chris Sontag, uh, we were working on a number of different things, but one of the things that we were running into was that we were constantly fitting data uh, 
by fitting this weight average thing. And we wanted to do more than that. We wanted to fit the entire shape of the boundary. And at that point, there were techniques out there that allowed us to fit the entire shape of the boundary. But we basically reproduced what um, Frigate and Timoshev did. Um, there's a description of tubulin purification. There's a description of how you collect data, the weight average, the curve fitting that you do to fit the data. But the one thing that we started out that was completely different was we said, this end to the two third model is no good. You've got to come up with a real model. This is the curve that is end of the two thirds. And so what this is saying is, is that if you're going to have a 42S, this is what the S value is going to be way out here, 42S. And this is what the S value is going to be out here. It's going to be 26 <clears throat> MERS to some power. Um, but you won't need much of it to give you a change in S because you think that it's sedimenting much faster than maybe it really does. And so what we did was we did some hydro analysis on different models, assuming linear models or helical models. It turns out that tubulin is actually a helix. And I told you already that that's really what we think it is. And then we also did it because hydro or bead modeling is just that, it's beads. And you substitute the macromolecule for bead-like structures. And if you treat the entire alpha subunit as a single bead, this is what you get. But you could also break it up into some finer beads that begin to try to define the tertiary structure of the subunit. And at the time in the literature, there was some 26 uh, a subunit model, uh, bead model that allowed you to kind of model each subunit separately. And so we did that for linear. And then we did a single bead for helical and a helical model for the single beads. It was a 21 bead model, excuse me. And you get completely different curves. And so the linear models would be down here at the bottom. But then the helical models would be something like this. And then we introduced not only helical, but a helical model where you're allowed to bend in different places. Okay, so can you only bend between dimers or can you also bend within a dimer? And so that creates a, a finer structure. And so we were able to do 21 bead and 42 bead models where we're essentially allowing various places where we can have helical turns <clears throat> to fit the data. And we were able to model using this hydro model in this way. So what you do is you come up with some kind of a model like this. You have to spatially define all of these positions and then you plug it into hydro. It's a software package. And then you, you come up with an S value for a given N and then you have points along a curve, and then you fit those data to some kind of a model. And the fit gives you some kind of a dependence of S on the Enmer size, here reflected as a J. And so you have some kind of a curvature that allows you to come up with what the right S value is for a dimer, a trimer, a tetramer, a pentamer, et cetera. And so you fit the whole curve, and then you can use this best fit to predict what the various S values are. And like in the Timoshev paper, you then plug those into the mathematics in exactly the same way. And I think it's not here. Okay. And then you can sort of model what these various things look like by plotting a distribution of oligomers as a function of S. So we're now going to model an indefinite polymerization, an isodesmic polymerization, where for the first few, remember that it didn't really go up into oligomers above 10 S, excuse me, above 10 mg per mil. So below 10 mg per mil, it's basically an indefinite. And so you could then ask how many big oligomers existed under a different set of conditions, and you would get a shape of what the boundary looks like. The software that we use to develop this is something called DCDT, and it creates a distribution 
It essentially creates what the Schlieren optics produce for you, except it's really plotting the concentrations of all the species. And as you get to bigger and bigger oligomers, you get this sort of skewed peak that forms at various sizes, okay? And so the legend will explain what's going on here. And some of these models use the end of the two thirds and some of these models use the different um, bead models. And you get different, very dramatically different shapes depending upon if you're using a 21 bead model or a 42 bead model, et cetera, okay? And so that was part of the whole issue. How good does the fitting do depending on the shapes, okay? And then we collected real data. And this is tubulin from my lab with up to 10 millimolar magnesium. So I, we didn't go quite as high. But what you can see is, is that protein concentration is each curve in each box. And magnesium concentration increases across the plot. Let's see if I can stretch this out a little bit. Okay, and so as you raise the magnesium concentration, the curve starts to shift to the right. So you're making oligomers. And as you raise the magnesium concentration, the shift becomes more and more dramatic. Okay, and so you can see a magnesium and a protein concentration dependence. And then you take the weight average and you plot these weight average data. And then you fit these in exactly the same way <clears throat> that Friggin and Timoshev fit these curves, where you plot tubulin and different magnesium concentrations. And then this is showing you models using different assumptions about the oligomers. Okay. And so this gives you a summary of a whole different series of um, different models, different magnesium concentrations and what the different indefinite polymerization constants are. And you can see the change in the, the goodness of fit for different kinds of models and which ones give you the best fits and which ones might give you the, the better estimate of what the equilibrium constants are. You can see that you get similar answers. So if you just went to 10 mg per mil, you get a dimerization or uh, indefinite polymerization constant with a free energy of minus 6.31, 6.94, 6.6, 7.1, 6.68, 6.9. So they're similar. So within error, you're doing a reasonable job, but you're not necessarily doing uh, any one model might be better. We think that we prefer the 42 bead model over the 21 bead model. We think for structural reasons, these are the best fits, but all of them do a pretty good job of fitting the data. And you can see that from the comparing one panel to another. The panels correspond to different models. The data here correspond to different magnesium concentrations. And you don't see a dramatic difference. Any of these models do a reasonable job. Okay, and that's why the outcomes are sort of reasonable. The RMSs are sort of reasonable. Um, it becomes a difficult sort of question. <clears throat> we choose this one because we think it's the best model that agrees with the actual structure, but all of them can do a pretty good job. And the reason for that is you're reducing this shape to a single number, a weight average. Okay, a weight average of these values fitted <clears throat> to any one of these models can approximately look like the rest of the data. <clears throat> this is in part because we're only in the isodesmic part of the curve. We're not in the Enmer part of the curve below. MIGs per mil. And I think that is, oh, this is, yeah, so this is really low concentration, actually. Millimolar magnesium. This is only going from two to 14 micromolar. So these are all the initial parts of the curves. 
where you can see the average values are really only going out to about eight or 10 S as opposed to 40 S, okay? But it's showing the methodology using the different sorts of models that you can come up with, okay? So then we looked at all of these data and did a Wyman plot, the log of the equilibrium constant versus the magnesium concentration. This is all our data. This is the friggin' Intimashev data. And so you can see that we're approximately getting the same answer. Where does it say that? Here is the data from friggin' Intimashev. Um, they got a value like this uh, in the paper. It says 1.15. I don't remember why we get a slightly different number. What you can see is that we get values that are slightly less than one. They're approximately one. Again, within error, these are all around 0.9, slightly less slope, but all of them say the same thing, that magnesium binding is associated with tubulin association or is coupled, that's the proper way to say this, linked or coupled so when tubulin adds, a magnesium ion binds. And it looks like one magnesium per dimer addition, okay? Um, So I, at the end of lecture, I showed you a software package that actually fits the shape of the boundary. And this is an example of that kind of a shape fit where we have, and where's the legend to this? Is it up above? Must be up above. Huh. Oh, figure six, figure seven here. So this is a different way of fitting the data. And so what this is doing is it's taking what is referred to here as delta C. And what that means is, is that you have, a, you have a pattern in a cell and there's a boundary sedimenting and there's another boundary later in time, radial dilution. And you literally subtract one of these from another, and that's a delta C. But you have a series of these. And so you create a series of difference curves, okay? And this is the first difference curve, and this is the last difference curve, and you might have multiple curves, you're not showing all of them, okay? So instead of plotting the weight average versus um, magnesium concentration or protein concentration, excuse me, protein concentration, generating some kind of a curve, we're actually fitting the raw data to the model where we're asking, how does this curve shift? Because each of these is at a different magnesium concentration or a different, excuse me, each of these is at a different protein concentration. And the whole data set is at a magnesium concentration. And we're basically trying to fit these data, but we're not trying to fit the average value. We're trying to fit the actual shapes of the curves, okay? <clears throat> and the advantage of this is you can see much more clearly when things don't fit. And when things don't fit, that means that there's maybe something wrong with the model or there's some other complexity in the model or maybe there's a little bit of aggregation and you only see it in the leading edge, or maybe there's some, something else going on in the early part of the data. And so you see it in the early part of the data. And so it allows you potentially to evaluate the goodness of the fit and, and, it, and have a finer picture of what might be going on, okay? And so this analysis is actually solving the LAM equation simultaneous sedimentation and diffusion, where the tubulin is allowed to indefinitely polymerize with the same equilibrium constant across the cell. 
<clears throat> and you can see that some of these fits look pretty good and some of these fits look a little ragged. And so it's suggesting that there may be something going on. Most of this ragged fitting tends to be at the high concentration ends at the top of the boundary where bigger oligomers might exist. Maybe there's small aggregates that are irreversible and aren't part of the chemistry, okay? Um, and so that's the kind of analysis that we're sort of worried about. Um, at this point in the paper, we also introduce the fact that a drug like vinblastin will also cause indefinite polymerization of tubulin but the indefinite polymerization is much stronger. Instead of being 10 to the third, 10 to the fourth, you'll notice these only go out to 10 to the fourth. Here they go out to 10 to the fifth at higher magnesium. These indefinite polymerizations will go out to 10 to the seventh, 10 to the eighth, depending upon the drug that we use. And so a lot more dramatic association. And so that's basically what is going on here, we're beginning to simply show that this technique works a little bit better um, with a, a drug like vinblastin. And this is showing the similar fitting of the weight average as a function of drug concentration, <clears throat> depending on what kind of a model you want to use. And you'll notice it's using an end of the two thirds model versus a helical model. And you get dramatically different association constants depending upon which model you use. You can see here that this goes as 10 to the 12th versus 10 to the 13th. And so there's a bigger sort of increase in the binding constant overall. The overall binding constant is the drug binding and the oligomerization. So the 10 to the seventh is the oligomerization. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. And you can see sort of dramatically different sort of values here um, that make this a little more um, insightful. Notice that the oligomers here go all the way up to 28S, not just 10S or 8S. So these are much bigger oligomers. At this point, we had published a lot of work on vinblastin, and we're not going to have time to look at all of these papers. But this was our first approach. This is one of the first papers we published using this method. In fact, I'm pretty sure. Let me come back up here. That the direct analysis of the sedimentation pattern where does it say it? Here's the hydro modeling. Uh, the name of the software was different. And I don't see the name of the software here. The software today, we call it Sedanal. At the time, I think we called it Isofitter. I'm not seeing it here. Huh. There must be another paper where the Isofitter was introduced. Somewhere in here, the name, the word isofitter should be in here somewhere. Okay. And so this would be the way that we really analyze data today. It's not that we can't do the weight average analysis, but it's this approach that gives us more insight into how we might tweak the model and how we might include aggregates, for example, as part of the model and say, aha, there's some junk that might be in here. Or there's some incapable tubulant that can't assemble. So there might be some trailing edge that might be in here, okay? And so some of these look a little bit different. And so that's figure seven, that's figure six. Figure six is the 10 millimolar magnesium. Oh, there's the isofitter, huh? <clears throat> so that was the original version of the software that we developed. Okay, uh, with different models. And I don't remember exactly now what the difference between these two sets of fits are. Part of the issue is, is that you're fitting shapes on all of the data at the same time. So we call it a global fit of all of the Delta C models at the same time on the data sets. 
Okay, and so you can see if there's some systematics and if there's some problems. So this is not solving the problem of, okay, how to better fit the data. It's simply showing this is really a paper that is introducing another way to fit data. And then since 2004, uh, we do everything with the Sentinel approach, direct boundary fitting. The weight average technique we almost never use anymore because this approach is far more informative. And then it also allows us to do statistics on the analysis in a much superior way. Okay. Questions about this? So those first two papers in 1975, circa 1975, <clears throat> if, if I have you present, and I think I'm going to give at least one paper <clears throat> on sedimentation analysis from the mid 90s to the, to the pre presentation list, um, you would see us plotting weight average data and fitting it to some kind of a model. Starting in 2004 with ISOFITTER and then Sedinal, uh, the paper Sedinal actually came out in this issue of this journal. Um, it was in this volume 108 and the software renaming and description came out in a separate paper in this issue <clears throat> where we then started using this name. Uh, everything we do now is not done by weight average fitting, not done by points like this. It's done by direct, what we call direct boundary fitting. Any questions? And then this shows a reanalysis of all the data with different kinds of fitting. And now we're doing direct boundary fitting uh, compared to the weight average fitting. And again, the data are similar, um, but you can begin to see sort of improvements, small improvements in different kinds of models, not dramatic improvements, um, which says that maybe we don't have everything perfectly right yet. And that it's maybe more complicated than this. Uh, and that's stuff that we sort of get into later when we start worrying about different aspects of the, the analysis. And this is showing some comparisons of just single channel fitting where things look a little bit better and showing that um, the single channel, single concentration fits tend to look better, quote unquote. <clears throat> That's usually evidence of heterogeneity. That's usually evidence of the fact that maybe Every isotype of tubulin doesn't polymerize in the same way. Some of the isotypes or some of the proteins may be denatured or irreversibly aggregated. <clears throat> and so the various different models give you slightly different results because when you fit it globally, it reveals these heterogeneities. If you fit a single data set, it looks pretty good. It's still not perfect. There's still a little bit of a hump in some of the data. That's, it's not completely flat, <clears throat> but it looks pretty good for different schemes where it's showing again, the end of the two thirds, the 21 bead model, which is linear or the 21 bead model, it's helical. and a slight different value for the Ks that you get, depending on what you're using. You can see the RMSs of the fits are pretty similar, so there's really no improvement here uh, at this level. Okay, I think that's the end. I'm now looking for a reference. Huh. There we go. <clears throat> Jose Garcia de la Torre. Uh, 
So I mentioned above, it was Bloomfield Van Holden, someone, the someone is De La Torre. And it was De La Torre who then took that and turned it into a, a bigger suite of software packages called Hydro. And for the seventies, eighties, nineties, De La Torre became the the leader in that aspect of the field. Here's the paper that introduces Hydro. Um, competition came along after that around the early 2000s. And that's why we now also have SOMO. <clears throat> and as I say, there's a new software package out there that's also now being used. I think the last time I published a bead modeling paper, I use that other software package instead of Hydro or Somo. Any questions? <clears throat> so these integrate sedimentation and reversible equilibria and thermodynamics and models of assembly and enthalpic and entropic driving forces and um, the dependence of equilibrium constants on protein concentrations, but also ligand concentrations and water concentrations. So there's all kinds of stuff that's integrated in thinking about and reading these papers, which is part of the point. The point is, is that you need all of these skills to interpret protein assembly models, solving the stoichiometry, solving the hydrodynamic problems, solving the shape problems, which we were not really good at in the early 70s. <clears throat> it worked, but a lot of the software packages weren't entirely functional yet. And they became functional as time went on. Let's see if I can actually... You see, 1994 is when the software package came out. So in that sort of gap, um, you sort of had to do it <clears throat> by existing packages, but people would develop their own packages. And then Jose figured that out in 94, and there have been multiple packages since then that sort of do different applications. Questions? Mm, Dr. Correa, when are you going to give us the paper for the presentation? I think I need a lot of time to really read the paper and understand. <clears throat> I'm, I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful. I'm almost ready. I, I keep choosing papers that I then don't like. In okay. the past, you know, this year we have seven students. And, and some, last year, last time I taught this, we had three. In the time before that, maybe I actually had one. <clears throat> so it was easy to find a paper or three papers. Mm. Seven papers has been a little bit harder and I keep changing my mind. I think some of the papers are uh, a little bit too complicated and I, and I want to have a kind of a range of different kinds of things. <clears throat> I'm almost ready. So yep. before Friday, you will get it. Okay, perfect. Because I felt like reading these two papers, I felt like I need a lot time to just interpret the data. Right, and, and what you need to do is think about what are the fundamental essential elements of the paper and what is it you need to present. Yeah. I don't want everybody to give an hour long presentation. I really want you to give a 20, 25 minute presentation. Yeah. <clears throat> and so there be, there'll be some, that's another part of the issue of choosing which papers I choose. Yeah. Um, and then who's gonna get what? How am I going to make that assignment? Am I going to let you choose? Am I going to roll dice? <clears throat> what are we going to do? I think we're going to almost roll dice. Okay, so it's not, you know, the, the first one who raises their hand. Uh, I think it'll be some kind of a random process. <clears throat> 
it'll be like a lottery. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That will not be on TV, but we'll try to do it somewhere. So maybe we'll try to do it on Friday when we go over um, some questions. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Sounds good. So yeah. Friday, we're going to also um, have a session. Do you want to do it again at 11 or at 12? I'm fine with 11 or 12. 11 is fine. 11, yeah. OK, so we've gotten two votes for 11. Is everybody happy with that? <clears throat> Silence means yes. 11 sounds good to me. Okay, now we got three. All right, so I'll see you Friday at 11, and that will be when maybe we try to assign papers. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to end now, and it will stop the recording. When I hit end, do you actually hear it say stop recording, stop? Or do I only hear it? I've never paid attention. Here we go. Do you uh, hear it or I not? I hear it. I can hear it. You hear it? Yeah, okay. I think it tells everybody.